Hello everyone and welcome back. It's Biomimicry Online Live, episode 11. So thrilled of, uh, that, you, that you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much. If you're watching us on replay, you can still get involved, so don't worry. Uh, but this is the 11th episode of what's been a fantastic little journey so far, going through some uh, amazing Biomimicry Online uh, modules that Sue Swain from BioWise has been developing for us. Uh, so on this 11th episode, we're going to go full circle and round up uh, and really start to look at how we can conclude this, this amazing journey. Uh, Sue's going to be joining us in a minute so we can uh, get stuck in with what is the sixth module, which is applying life's lessons. So really excited to get stuck in with that. Um, if you've got any questions, you can type those in the comment section of where you're watching it and we'll aim to answer that live. If we don't get around to answering it, while we are live, we can get back to you afterwards. So you've got no excuse to get involved as much as possible. As per usual, what we're going to do just to start this off is just once again do a little bit of an introduction uh, to some of the elements of biomimicry, what it, what it is, take a sort of a step back, and then we're going to bring Sue on and we're going to uh, talk about our specific topics, which is all about uh, biomimicry as a way of being. And then, as I mentioned, going into module six, which is applying life's lessons. So let's take a little step back and, and journey into what biomimicry is all about. Let's have a look at this. Imagine an experience that ignites the same spirit of adventure and pursuit of discovery as exploring the outer limits of space. But where the adventure lies not beyond our galaxy, but right here in exploring the extraordinary diversity and hidden depths of this planet. An experience that reveals how nature is a vast library of ingenuity we can learn from. A library filled with proven, real solutions for all our human development and sustainability challenges. Solutions based on the billions of years of research and development by the natural world's designers, architects, engineers, and scientists. This is the science of biomimicry. The practice. Hey Sue, hello. Thank you so much for joining. How are you doing tonight? I'm very well, thanks, Roger. Always good to see you, and thanks very much again for setting this all up. No, no, thank you. Thank you for joining. Really excited. I can't believe we had 11 episodes uh, moving through, you know, so many nice topics. Um, and yeah, hopefully let's just keep getting conversation going and, and trying to get uh, some questions through. I know we've had a few sent in in advance, which is really exciting. Um, and, and yeah, hopefully we can get stuck in with this, the sixth module now. So I don't know if, if you want to um, give a little bit of an introduction of, of your sort of thoughts as you were developing uh, module six, applying life's lessons. Um, yeah, I, th I think I was just really what came home to me, how, how much it is very much about really healing the relationship, our relationship with nature, um, you know, as it relates specifically to our approach to biomimicry as a way of being. So, so that came, that was quite an exciting module for me to really develop that and delve into it more, more deeply. So, um, but then to also combine it with the, the practical, the, you know, using life's blueprint but understanding that puts us into right relationship. How can we also have rich relationship with nature? Yeah. Nice, nice. So, um, so far we've gone through, as I said, this is the sixth module now. The first one, Biomicry is a way of being, just sort of introducing. And then we went into rediscovering our planet. Uh, reconnecting with self was uh, module number three. Module number four is reconnecting with fellow life on Earth. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we got to learning from life and then applying life's lessons, which is the, the last one now, which we're going to talk about. So anyone who's tuning in for the first time or maybe missed some of these live streams, um, you can you can go back and, and watch watch any of them on the Expedition Project websites or on the various social media pages that are hosting them um, and catch up on them. And if you see anything you like, you can still post in your questions and, uh, you know, we'll get notified and we can answer them, you know, Soon as we as soon as we can so there's lots of ways to to get involved with this uh so i think probably let's let's get it started off we've got uh this first section we've broken this module up into two parts so we've got episode 11 part one um and this is all about the need to live differently so we've got a little bit of a clip that we want to show you um and this is just sort of introducing uh some of the life friendly uh chemistry so um say no more i suppose let's just crack on with that and then and then we can talk about it a bit check this out 
when it comes to chemistry, we need to understand chemistry is huge in nature. From using chemicals to produce light, to create miracle fibers, produce miracle substances like adhesives. Nature's chemistry is life friendly. They use a small safe subset of, of chemicals. They use water only as a solvent. Everything is produced locally and on demand. And the chemists, of course, are not harmed. They don't need protection from the chemicals they're producing. And even when toxins need to be produced, maybe to protect oneself or to feed, the manner in which that, that those toxins are produced is also equally impressive. It's only, they only produce what is needed. The toxin itself is highly selective. It doesn't poison anyone else other than the target. Often the toxin is used to repel rather than to kill. And the toxins break down into benign reusable substances at the end of its life. I mean, there's so many things to unpack in that in that one minute that uh, you, you've done just to give everyone out there an idea of how much knowledge and experience and thought all these modules have. You know, if that's one minute, there's so much to actually go into. Um, one, the first thing I probably want to say, Sue, is your Biowise logo um, is a spider web on it. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, but to also show the interconnectedness of everything. Nice. So, and, and obviously, you, you know, got an image of, you know, a spider and a web there. Uh, you know, I'm going to jump the gun here and probably assume that it's, it, it's, it's one of the most fascinating species out there that can produce and do what it is and linking up to all those things that, that you were just saying there. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, if you just think, you know, spider silk, ounce for ounce, five times stronger than steel. And, you know, it's produced in the body of, of the spider. I mean, I love how it's been sometimes communicated that it literally does so by taking in a fly in, fly in one end and producing a miracle fiber out the other end, because that's kind of literally what they do. Um, but, you know, what's truly remarkable that at the, the end of it, some spiders are known to even be able to eat the web um, in order to actually extract and reabsorb some of the silk proteins that they can reuse again. And that's, I mean, so not only in the chemistry, but in how they deal with it, they, those are, you know, the kind of lessons. And of course, you compare that to our chemistry, you know, the closest thing we come to is Kevlar, um, which sure, it can stop a bullet. But, you know, it's, it's the amount of toxic waste that are produced in the process it's put under extreme temperature and extreme pressure to extrude the fibers and uh yeah you just there's no i mean I'm, I, I doubt anyone can eat their kevlar vest after it's served its purpose you know so um yeah so there, there's there we've we've got a long way to go uh in terms of understanding what is possible but i think also one of the most important facts to understand is you know, throughout this um, this little journey or expedition we've gone on with Biomimica Online, is that um, you know, is, is understanding that there are these limits and boundaries. And while the planet has effectively 117 chemical elements, life has essentially used a very small safe subset of those, around, around about 16 elements plus a further trace elements of 10. And so somehow life has figured out that those are the safe elements. Those are the ones that can break down and be reabsorbed, et cetera. But unfortunately, we came along and once we started getting into fossil fuels and being able to use extreme temperature and pressures, you know, we started forcing chemicals into combinations that the earth hasn't seen in 3.8 billion years. So nature can't recognize, assimilate, absorb or break down those chemical combinations. Um, but imagine, imagine you could say to every school laboratory and all of that, here are the safe elements that you can play with and guarantee you can play to your heart's content because you're not gonna come up with a combination that 3.8 billion years of evolution hasn't done. 
you know so what what you produce will be something recognizable absorbable and and break downable if there is such a word <laughs> no, i'm so i'm so glad you actually sort of went into that into that element of it because i was thinking um when i was doing this module that um you know you say uh, these sort of these animals and stuff obviously don't need protective clothing they're doing you know everything mm -hmm. they're using is sort of natural resources and all of that and they're not doing any weird combinations but there's still elements in nature out there in their simplistic form that are damaging to certain species or something that an animal produces, I suppose, themselves might not be harmful to them, but it could be, could be harmful to, to another species, I suppose. Is that right? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly that, that, that's why, you know, I pointed out the, the, the snake, um, snake venom. But I mean, again, you think, well, what is the purpose of the venom? Is it to poison an entire species, an entire range of creatures, or is it to actually, since I don't have limbs that I can leap out and catch something, it's my means of being able to, to catch some prey, paralyze the prey and be able to eat it in that way. So the point being that um, the toxins they produce are actually selective and they only produce enough that is needed. It, I, it, I believe that uh, adult puff adders and things like that, snakes, if, if they come across a person that stands on them or something, will bite, but not necessarily even inject the poison wow. because they don't want to waste the toxin. We're not prey. You know, they want to, they need their toxin to, to catch their prey, basically. And the beauty of that, though, is even if the mouse was to get away and a bird was to swoop down and grab that mouse, the toxins will not affect the bird. Wow. Now, compare that to what we're doing. You know, we have stuff that we spray on crops that is killing, um, you know, birds of prey and, and things like that. So there's just so much to for us to learn and to understand that whatever we do has to happen within the system within which we are, are, are living. So the snake venom, and if, you know, if that mouse gets away or if the snake dies or something like that, you don't have to go out and organize a toxic waste truck. Those chemicals have already started to break down into the harmless carbon, hydrogen, oxygen that they, they were formed from, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, um, so exciting stuff that, that awaits for us if we have the humility to, to learn from nature. So you mentioned sort of Kevlar and, you know, what always comes to mind is, is such a, um, I suppose, one of those groundbreaking biomimicry, you know, um, innovations and stuff like that was um sort of velcro and stuff like that did um have they started to venture you know on the, on the sort of innovation side and the development side have they started to venture into you know kevlar or velcro that is you know not made of what it's made of it's still using the principles and it's got natural kind of uh, elements or biodegradable mm. you know, design and stuff like that have they gone to that next step yet do you know uh, there are some companies, definitely now the name of the company escapes me, but basically they, they studied mussels, as in the mussels that grow on rocks in the coast, and they also have managed to produce an adhesive that has been produced at low temperatures, and now we're starting to understand, you know, it's not about these heat beaten treat methods, but low temperatures that do not need formaldehyde or any kind of toxic chemical that goes in it. Um, and, and they've produced a, an adhesive that works equally well um, when submerged underwater and, and out of water. So, so they really took it seriously to understand the next level, not just understanding, wow, this fantastic adhesive of the, of the muscle, but gosh, we really need to start mimicking the processes that nature has used. So I think that is starting to come through more and more and also the realization often that chemistry is almost subserv not subservient, that's not the right word, but secondary to physics. Um, and that it's often done in combination. So where you instinctively think that that's a, uh, you know, chemicals are being used to produce color or something like that, you actually discover, well, hang on, it's actually being done primarily through physics. Um, so, 
yeah, you know, it's it's really exciting fields, but I do think the field of chemistry has, um, you know, huge potential. No, but way. As, yeah. yeah, but as long as the ethos of biomimicry is kept in the forefront of everyone's brains in terms of are we creating conditions conducive to all life in what we do? You know, um, we must have targeted toxins. If we have to have toxins, we need to understand that nature often repels rather than seeks to kill. Um, you know, all of those kind of um, approaches really need to be considered deeply before we leap in. And and again, I can never express more than the need for humility when we're doing anything that we're designing and innovating yeah. with the yeah. Mm. Okay, so uh, the second of the three little clips we've got, which are just sort of delving into some of the topics um, within Module 6, which is applying life's lessons. Um, so this next one's all about the principles um, and, and how uh, the same principles are sort of found across the different sort of ecosystems and everything like that. So, so let's have a little look at this. Check this out. A reminder that life's blueprint is essentially the deep patterns and principles that are applied by all organisms everywhere. The same principles and patterns are found in every single ecosystem, whether they're savanna, whether that's savanna, forest, desert, tundra, marine. They're just obviously being applied in response to the particular local conditions. So this is key to understand the principles are universal. So they're applicable no matter your personal situation, circumstances, where you live. Of course, how you apply them will be determined though by your particular context. So that's part of applying life's lessons. It's a it's a lesson within that module, um, which is which is module six. So I, I don't know if you want to sort of unpack that a little bit without obviously giving away too much of the whole lesson. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, no. Look, uh, I, I think that you know the the key there is that we tend to be a bit reductionist in our thinking as a species. So, you know, we'll say, well, if we just, we start with that and then we can ultimately move on to that. And that. But nature is doing all sorts of things all the time in response to the fact, and it's all in response to our planetary conditions, the fact that we are this closed system planet, that what we have is what we've got. The fact that we're a dynamic planet subject to constant change and the fact that everything is interconnected. Um, so in, in terms of responding to that, um, the principles need to be applied wherever you are. So whether you live in a forest or a coral reef or whatever, um, the principle of, you know, not wasting resources and replenishing what you have and operating in cycles is, is critical. Um, you know, basically use the least amount possible, but also replace that which you've used. Um, or contribute to replacing that which you've used. Um, that that needs to be applied wherever you are, kind of thing, you know. So that's just one example. Um, but yeah, and do the do the, the the sort of attitudes apply as well as the actions? So kind of you know you you always there's always these amazing words that you use to encompass the things you know collaboration and humility and all of that. Um, you know, do those apply in the same way as, as some of these those actions do? Yes, absolutely. So, so collaboration and partnership is an essential part of of, of um, any ecosystem. Uh, you do find um, sometimes interspecies competition um, exists, but interspecies is far more collaborative. There, you will always find there's a sharing of territory and resources. Um, you know, I don't know, just trees seem to instinctively know also that a forest is only as strong as its weakest link, for instance. And um, the forest economy is based equally on, you know, the millions of microscopic organisms in the soil as it is on the giant yellow woods or redwoods or, or whatever forest it might be. So um, collaboration, working together, ensuring the health of each other is just a strategy you find everywhere, except with our species, <laughs> often. We're, we're always bringing that partnership and that team down, aren't we? Really are. Yeah. Um, um, and, and it does seem like there's, there's, there's often 
so many good intentions in in what we do and why, but those good intentions seem to be removed by the the element of of greed or the element of you know non humility or lack of collaboration or, or long term planning, and that seems to override so many of those good intentions that are out there. Mm, and power seeking, um, yeah, I, it, it 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 does, but I think. What, what we are seeing emerging is, is grassroots movements, and, and that is how it has to be. Um, one of the points I make in this um, module is that we can't seek to change the world, but you can seek to change your world, you know, how you're living and, and then having influence in those immediately around you and, and things like that. So I think that that's important to not get despondent because as a species as a whole, um, we've got a lot to learn, but uh, where we're going to make the difference and, and, and that is at grassroots level. And um, yeah, so that's always something to think of. And I always love the, the quote, uh, I won't be able to say it exactly word for word, but um, uh, never underestimate the power of one person or one person can change the world because in fact mm. Mm. that that whole ripple effect absolutely and um you know the the con the converse of that is also you know for evil or something bad to happen it just takes you know a good person to do nothing so doing nothing is never an, an, a solution, you know. As despondent as one might get, it's it's really um, never underestimate the seeds you plant through the conversations you have, um, you know, things like that, as well as the actions you take. So let's let's move on to the final clip and and sort of the second part, which is some of the the more sort of actionable things and how we can obviously go about applying some of uh, life's blueprints. So um, a lovely little clip here, very short, very to the point. Um, and, and, and I love this one because it, it is something we can all do. Uh, and it's something I know a lot of us are trying to do. Um, but I suppose the long story short is we need to do it more. So um, have, a, have a look at this. And it comes to the practical application. It's not about trying to change the whole world. It's actually about changing my world, making a difference in my world, my community, my local ecosystem. This is where the difference is that I can make, certainly as a start. So in this, keeping it local actually takes on an additional meaning. So great minds think alike. That's just what you said, and that's a fantastic way to to round up, I suppose, uh, that module in my head, I suppose, if, mm. if, you, if you want to really simplify it down. Mm, mm, absolutely. Bringing it home, keeping it local, you know, and that then extends into the simple practical things like, you know, to what extent am I meeting my own food needs? Start growing, you know, start off with a, a couple of herbs and then see where you can take it further. And often you might find, well, that's where collaborating with my neighbor comes in because I'm really great at growing tomatoes but not so good at potatoes and you know you can swap or whatever and and obviously try and grow a diversity because diversity is nature's insurance policy so um but yeah yeah keeping it local is is a is a really good starting point um but thinking you know beyond just the traditional um thinking yeah how am i meeting my own needs is my household meeting its own needs for water um, energy, all of those things, yeah. So for the final few minutes, let's dive into a few questions that have got sent in, if that's okay with, with you, Sue. Um, sure. uh, so yeah. what about biophilia and biomimicry? Are they the same or similar things? That's from Tanya. Great. Uh, great question, Tanya, because, uh, yeah, I know um, this, this does come up often. And... Um, Biophilia is, is essentially, if you uh, translate it, it's the love of life, uh, love of things living. Um, and it's really a, it's about the connection that we kind of need as biological beings, um, that, that we have an innate connection 
um, with nature that, that we, we need to experience. And so biophilic design seeks to try and capture those connections and those experiences. So it's often looks at interior design and things like that, maybe bringing in plants inside buildings, incorporating them into office space and things like that, um, having similar, you know, uh, patterns um, in, in whatever, the design of chairs and things like that, that, that are more organic in shape that remind us of the kind of shapes and patterns you find in nature. Um, whereas biomimicry is really an approach to innovation where you're trying to emulate uh, nature's um, strategies and principles and designs and features um, in order to maybe have greater efficiency and effectiveness in terms of your innovation and design. I don't know if that um, come to help. What, what I thought was maybe quite an interesting example to explain the difference was when Interface, the carpet company, approached by mimicry folk um, because they made carpet tiles. And, um, you know, so you find that when if red wine or something is spilt on one tile and you wanted to go and replace one, you end up having to replace the whole section because you can immediately see you've got one brand new tile versus others. And that's because we often have uniform patterns in our carpets. So when they approached the biomimicry folk, they said, well, what's an example of nature's flooring? And you come up with leaflet on the forest floor, pebbles on a beach. It's actually random patterns. Mm -hmm. So they incorporated a random pattern into the design of their carpets which meant they could replace individual tiles. So the, the, and what that did for them was cut waste to landfall by nearly 99%. Okay, so from an efficiency reducing waste kind of perspective, that was brilliant. But one of the reasons why that particular, not brand of carpet, but style or whatever, can't get to the word, but it became a bestseller overnight and a lot of that had to do with the fact that the random patterns, we are innately attracted to random patterns. So that's an example of biophilia and biomimicry coming together kind of thing. If, that's if such I'm an amazing that. example. And, and oh, I just it, it's good in so many levels just thinking about that, actually. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And, and funny enough, they took it further and, and they studied the gecko and used a... Um, physics to actually glue the carpet to the ground and then eventually realize that gravity has enough force that they didn't need anything. So, you know, nature's always evolving towards great efficiency, effectiveness and all of that. So, yeah, so I thought that was quite a cool example. So I'm so Mate. glad that came to me. <laughs> I love that example. Well done. I'm thinking on your feet there for that. That's absolutely brilliant. So um, Connor uh, sent through this question, says, um, have you seen any examples of applying life's lessons to cure any serious diseases? Um, I suppose I always think, you know, you've got, you know, ginger's great for, you know, the gut and you know you have this loads of little things that are just good for like you know general simple things and i suppose that is quite a good question actually so what about the real no, it is a good question but and of course using ginger um as a means is, is not so much biomimicry because mm -hmm. that's kind of bio utilization but in a good way i mean that's just being sensible um the one thought that came to me okay is that if we consider depression i think depression and 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 you know, mental illnesses are becoming very serious diseases out there. And it is proven beyond a doubt that reconnecting with nature, spending time in nature, which is a key element of biomimicry, and especially of biomimicry as a way of being, um, is, is as the, the, you know, the science is out in terms of that. Um, there are countless studies that prove, you know, it lowers blood pressure, it um, improves moods and, um, and all of those things um, to the extent that there are things now called green prescriptions where uh, general practitioners are prescribing time in nature as a, um, as a cure or a means of dealing with the, the um, you know, uh, particularly depression and, and things like that. Um, 
I think there's there is a lot of potential um, from robotic techno technologies. You've got um, like the gecko and the gecko's foot and how it is on the um, how it sticks to the, the surface by having millions of microscopic hairs and that allows a very gentle peeling. For instance, it's not a curing a big disease, but they're, they're using it for micro suturing, uh, suturing on um, blood vessels and things like that, which are very difficult to stitch without damaging the vessels. Even this, this, you know, that kind of thing can be done. You've got the tardy grade that has brought out a whole new way of um, preserving uh, vaccines instead of having to keep them refrigerated. And um, I did do a, a, a dive into it, and um, they're also looking at things like, um, now it sounds like I'm going to get it, like senile dementia and Alzheimer's, um, using biomimetic um, nanotechnology to actually prevent the, the brain signals that, that actually cause the degeneration and things like that. Um, but I also think really the, the prevention side of it is, is the most critical um, and that, you know, we could, yeah, spend more time in nature to prevent a lot of things. Eating healthily and things like that are one of the best things you can do. But I think the more and more people become aware of the potential that nature has been there before us and knows what to do. Um, you know, I think there are the, the potential for it to to help boost immunity, uh, to help repel bacteria, and all of those things is going to be absolutely huge. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, and I thought this one was great for, for COVID-related uh, stuff. So Rachel says, um, I've heard that uh, cicada wings produce antibacterial substances. Have we used something like this for our own cleaners or disinfectants? Okay, great question. Um, of course, with COVID, they did find that simple water and soap with as well as all of these other things that we came up with so keep it simple is one of nature's lessons but um funny enough what i mentioned earlier is the cicada wing, wings what they've discovered is that it's again it's a combination of physics and and chemistry because if you look close if you take them you know magnify not a magnifying glass a um, microscope and you look really closely electron microscope you will see that the cicada wings are made up of nano pillars um, which have a waxy covering so there's the chemistry the nano pillars are the, the structure and what they do is repel bacteria the nature does that nine times out of ten it's it's about repelling bacteria why because bacteria are not all bad we can't digest a morsel of food without the beneficial bacteria in our gut and bacteria are the most ancient of beings they are masters at mutation gene trading and symbiosis you put them under threat they mutate to become superbugs but if you can get them to be repelled um, then they don't feel threatened, they don't seek to mutate and things like that. And bacteria can only work, they, how they work is they communicate, if one lands on a surface, it communicates up to the others, and once a quorum of bacteria have joined it, that's when they can colonize and for, cause a problem. So um, I don't think that something has specifically been designed yet based on cicada wings, but you have got chocolate technologies where it is the nanostructure in shark skins, which was found to be repelling bacteria, preventing the communication between bacteria so they could land. And chocolate technologies have developed um, surfaces and coatings for on um, in surgical wards and things like that. So where you simply prevent the bacteria from actually um, colonizing and becoming a problem. So, yeah, I think that's a great... Um, question Rachel and and many many lessons within that that often yeah it's more about repelling than anything else not and not seeking to kill that often creates more of a problem 
And a fantastic question, probably perfect to round round things up, actually, because it probably takes away uh, your job of uh, coming up with today's takeaway um, <laughs> and today's final point. So, um, so Sheila says, what are the top three ways you recommend applying life's lessons in our day to day life? Okay, well, um, funny enough that that keep it local was one of the first. If we're going to look at, um, I'm going to look at two things: the really practical side of things, like keeping it local, um, and that means looking at how much am I meeting my own needs? Am I am I living off of harvested rainwater, or am I depending on you, you know municipal or council? Um, infrastructure to get water to me, growing my own food, um, those kind of things. But also another one that I really like, which is also starts, you know, very practical, is about wasting nothing, um, which is different from producing no waste, because we do kind of produce waste or byproducts. But the essence is to say, well, how do we turn that into a resource? How do we not waste anything that comes out of it, you know, um, what is produced? So that that's something to really think about. Um, and taking it also into the more the metaphorical, like not wasting any opportunities that come your way. Uh, that's also important. Um, so wasting nothing, you know, a simple example for me is I gave up a, a rubbish bin in December 2018. And I don't have a rubbish bin at home. I use it to catch rainwater, actually. <laughs> but um, I have a bottle brick ultimately to, to take my, my, my last bit of packaging waste because packaging waste is, is a huge problem. Um, as much as uh, you know, you can try your level best, but um, as long as you're buying food still from supermarkets and that you have packaging waste. And then um, for me, the, the really, really important part of applying life's lessons, though, is to one of life's lessons is, is live in relationship. It's collaboration. And I think that's really is making it daily practice to get out there and spend quality time in nature, re-establishing relationship again with the living world around you. I think that, to me, honestly, is the most important because it's once we get our relationship right, once we feel part of and belonging and, and understanding, uh, the other things, the more practical things, just start to flow naturally. Fantastic. So I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, no, no, you've rounded that up nicely. And obviously that, that's covered the takeaway as well, which is amazing. <laughs> Unless there's anything else you want to add on onto that, I think it's pretty much the same, the same topic though. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I think that summed it up. Perfect. Um, so yeah, that's that's all the time we've got. And and as always, we could keep chatting and keep chatting. You you saying so many things that I want to delve into more, but uh, you know, we like to keep these these uh, live streams, you know, short and sharp and, and to the point. Um, and, and yeah, want you to tune back to, to more so we can get the conversation going. So we're going to uh, take a little break now until September 2022. Um, so look out for updates um, on Sue's page, on the Expedition Projects page. And, um, and uh, yeah, we'll look out for the next sort of dates as we plan the, the next series and what's coming up. But in the meantime, you've got plenty of time to go and explore Biomimicry Online, as well as revisit Biomimicry Online Live if you want to check out any of the live streams we have done over the, the last 11 episodes. Uh, and then there's six modules on Biomimicry Online, six amazing modules, um, which are, are just so brilliant. And, you know, the the feedback from, you know, the, the learners and, and the individuals that have been doing them have just been so amazing. I just can't recommend them highly enough. Really do go and check them out. Um, and and you know take your time with them. There's there's no rush in doing them. It's the the um, we designed them very specifically so that you you don't have to finish them within a specific time. That you don't get sort of timed out. That you don't have to check in all the time. So you can basically go through the videos and go through the lessons at two o'clock in the morning if you want. 
um, and then send in questions, you know, as, as they come to you and follow on the little sort of steps that Sue so nicely laid out and the little tasks that you can do in your own time. And then just check in with us on these live streams when we have them. So um, we think it's a really nice collaborative sort of dynamic and innovative way of doing it. And we hope you agree and hope you go and check them out and, and support all the work that we've put into to doing this. Uh, we'd absolutely love that. Um, so from, from us, Sue, thank you so much uh, for joining once again. Uh, we'll see you back in a, in a few months. Um, uh, just thank you so much for your time. It's always great chatting to you. Um, and yeah, I think that's it from us. Uh, we'll sign out and, and see you all next time. Super. Thanks very much, Roger. Thanks for everything. Have a good break. And I look forward to, to connecting with everyone later in September. Thanks, Sue. And thanks, everyone. See you soon.